So I'm, I'm going to spend about an hour talking about a lecture that I titled Radio Biology, but frankly, it's going to be a little bit of, you know, how do we measure dose, a little bit of patient dosimetry, a little bit of radio protection, radiation protection, and a little bit of uh, radio biology. So it's kind of hard to cram all of that into one hour, um, but I really want to hit some of the really salient points in terms of that. So the objectives you have listed there, here's our outline. Um, we had talked a little bit when we were first talking about the basics, about how radiation interacted with matter. Uh, we talked about the linear uh, energy transfer. I showed one picture of that, and I want to just go back and look at that again and talk about low LET radiation, low linear energy transfer radiation, which is predominantly what we'll be dealing with, and high LET. You guys are already familiar with these X-ray interactions because the same interactions that we talked about in terms of uh, uh, scattering in the patient and decreasing our image, and image quality and things and absorption in the patient are really the things that result in patient dose. So linear energy transfer is defined as the amount of energy deposited per unit path length. So the units are in electron volts per millimeter. It's proportional to the charge of the particle squared. So the more charge something has, the more energy it's going to transfer. And it's inversely proportional to the particle's kinetic energy, which is a little bit counterintuitive. It just so happens that the more kinetic energy it has, the faster it's moving, let's say, the less likely it is, is to in interact. Um, and LET basically is defined by the, is calculated by the specific ionization pairs, right? Say so ionization pairs per millimeter times the average energy deposited by ion pair. So the ion pairs can cancel out, and you end up with electron volts deposited per millimeter of tissue traveled. <clears throat> this is what really largely determines the biologic effect of, of radiation. Um, in general, high LET radiation, that from alpha particles, that from protons, remember protons are 2,000 times more massive than an electron, are much more damaging than the low LET radiation we're going to be dealing with uh, electrons, and the ionizing electromagnetic radiation we'll be dealing with gamma rays and x-rays. And I want to make the point, and I'll make it a couple times, right? What happens when gamma rays and x-rays interact in the tissues? Well, first thing they do is produce things like photoelectrons. And so now you have energetic electrons running around. In other words, you've created some low LET particulate uh, radiation by that initial interaction of that X-ray or gamma ray with those electrons in the material. They travel very different paths in matter, okay? So the particle path length, length is the actual length uh, of the path that it travels, and the range is the depth that it travels. So here's the picture I showed you before. So notice this low LET uh, radiation, so this could be an electron, right? It just bounces around, and it has a very long path length, but its range is quite a bit shorter than that. While high LET radiation, really its path length and its range are about the same. It's that Mack truck when it starts to hit cars on the highway, right? It, they all move out of its way. It continues on its path, if you will. And it turns out that these different types of radiation end up depositing their dose at different depths. And I want to emphasize that. So when you look at electrons, we talked about the fact that energetic electrons really deposit almost all of their dose within tenths of millimeters of where they uh, are emitted from. And notice that's quite different for protons. And this is kind of the idea behind uh, proton beam therapy, that right, protons travel quite a distance, you know, 15 centimeters or so, and this varies a little bit depending upon how energetic they are, what their kinetic energy is, but you can really deposit a tremendous amount of dose at a relatively fixed diff distance. And of course, you can vary where this actually occurs in the body by putting a, some sort of a water bath on the surface of the patient and doing different things. And remember, he, here are photons, here are X-ray photons, so a little bit deeper than that uh, electron surface, and that shouldn't surprise us because, again, they're going to predominantly give their energy um, to electrons uh, when they interact. Um, so we always say, you know, the entrance skin dose is the highest, and that's not quite true, right? It's a little bit below the surface of the skin that actually sees that uh, dose. 
We've talked about the photoelectric and Compton interactions. I want to go back and again emphasize over and over again those energetic electrons and free radical production that those are going to result in. Remember the photoelectric effect is when one of our X-rays or gamma rays um, interacts <clears throat> typically with one of the inner shell electrons of the atoms that uh, they're in, uh, entering, and they kick those out of the shell and they impart basically their energy to that, and so the energy that they have is now the energy of the initial X-ray minus the binding energy, binding shell energy. So quite an energetic photoelectron floating around now interacting with those tissues. In the body, we do still get characteristic or Auger electron production, but notice it's quite low energy, right? This is, uh, this is 3.6 keV. It's just kind of above the visible. Um, I'm sorry, way above the visible, but much lower than things that would ex escape the body. Compton scatter, we talked about, we, we now get this interaction with typically some of these outer shell electrons, and these uh, X-ray photons or gamma ray photons are going to give some of their energy to those and kick them out of the shell, and they're going to continue on in a slightly different direction. And we mentioned the fact that when this occurs, the um, X-ray can scatter off at a substantial angle with relatively small amounts of decrease in their initial energy. And you know, this can, we said, either escape the body and maybe not strike our film, escape the body and backscatter and uh, put dose in the operator, let's say during a fluoro exam, or frankly, this could interact with some other electron in the body, right, and cause a, a photoelectric type interaction or perhaps another Compton type interaction. Um, so a multiple different things that could happen there. And so we then get this, you know, lower, this lower energy 5 uh, keV Compton electron here, so where part of that uh, uh, dose was imparted to it there. So these energetic electrons, right, ionizing electromagnetic radiation like X-rays, gamma rays, uh, is not described by LET, right? LET is specifically meant to describe particulate radiation absorption. Um, and so it doesn't apply to things that have no mass and have no charge. But the first thing that this electromagnetic radiation does is produce those energetic electrons that we just showed examples of again. Um, and those secondary electrons can be described using that LET notion. So it shouldn't be surprising that when we look at the relative weighting factors of how much damage that different types of radiation do, that gamma rays and X-rays really fall in the same category as low LET radiation like uh, energetic electrons, okay? Those energetic electrons produced, we've mentioned the fact that they can produce uh, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of ion pairs. And because the body is composed of a lot of water, a lot of those are hydroxyl rad radicals, right? A OH minus, um, which can have quite a del deleterious effect there. So how do we now try to, to measure what those damaging effects are by measuring what the radiation dose is that ends up being absorbed by the body. Well, so I want to start just really go through an introduction of some of the measures that we have and, and hopefully provide you with a better understanding of some of those. So these are the ones I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk a little bit about exposure and really the, the more modern quantity that kind of replaces that. But then some of these other quantities were basically derived from exposure. So I'm going to continue down the exposure to describe how absorbed dose was kind of extended from that notion and then equivalent dose extended from the notion of absorbed dose and finally effective dose from that. And really the important things that I want you to remember when we finish are kind of the basic definitions of these things but also what they're useful for and really this absorbed dose is going to be the most important thing in terms of us deciding what the deterministic effects of radiation might be. So things like cataracts, radiation burns, those kind of things are really going to be best quantified by evaluating what the absorbed dose is for a particular tissue.
And then this effective dose is really going to be the thing that we're going to utilize to help try and quantify what the population effects of radiation, ra radiation are. So the stochastic effects on the population. What, what is the uh, probability that it induces a, a cancer in a, a, how many cancers would be induced, let's say, in 100,000 people or so? So let's start with exposure. Exposure is the amount of charge liberated per kilogram of air by the X-ray beam. And the main reason this was one of the first quantities developed is, you know, if you're going to have a quantity, you have to have some way to measure it. And, and measuring exposure was relatively straightforward, right? You could put a little ionization chamber with some air in it and uh, put that in front of the X-ray beam and see how much charge was liberated by just measuring the current that flowed across the uh, the the uh, anode and cathode of that uh, ionization chamber. So it was something that could easily be measured. And it's really only defined for photons with energy less than 3 MeV. Remember, if we get up in that higher range, we start to get these crazy things where we can get pair production, right, and photo disintegration. So this really only works well for, for energies under that. And this isn't used for um, particulate radiation. This is really just used to evaluate electromagnetic radiation in that lower range. And of course, exposure uh, measurements, uh, they obey the inverse square law, right? If I, if I measure what the exposure is one foot from the source of gamma rays or one foot from the X-ray tube and I move two feet away, the amount of exposure that I'm going to measure is going to have decreased by, f by four, right? When I double the distance, I'm going to decrease my exposure by the square of that. And it's useful for measuring film exposure, exposure on uh, an x-ray plate, but really it's a poor assessment of radiation risk. So here's what we're talking about, right? You fill some chamber with air, you expose it to an x-ray source. We already talked about because of some of the interactions that we see where you end up kicking electrons out of shells, you create some ions. Those ions now flow towards the positively or negatively charged plates, the holes versus the electrons, and we can measure a current flowing through that circuit, and that current is proportional to the exposure. Early on, you know, one of the things you did with this was put this between the patient and the film or screen, right? And when it reached a certain level, you could actually shut off the x-ray equipment. It said that you had an adequate level of exposure to that x-ray plate. And so hence, hence the term, right, that why we call this the exposure. Um, it tells us nothing about how much energy is being absorbed by the tissues that are being irradiated, right? That's a much more challenging thing to measure. How do you, what do you do? You try and stick sensors in the patient and try to measure that, right? Measuring this quantity in air is a much easier task. It doesn't really tell us where in the body that radiation was being absorbed. So it's not tremendously helpful in terms of knowing the variability, taking into account the variability of uh, different tissue sensitivity to radiation. And for that reason, like I've already said, it's very limited in its utility for evaluating the biologic effects of radiation. Here's the newer concept. Rather than looking about at the amount of charge deposited per kilogram of air, let's look at how much energy is being deposited per kilogram of air. So KERMA, kinetic energy released in media, is not just defined for air, but it's defined for anything. What's the soft tissue KERMA? How much kinetic energy is released into the soft tissues? And so instead of having the units of coulombs per kilogram, right, so charge per unit mass, it has the units of energy per unit mass, joules per kilogram. Uh, and the air kerma really has replaced that notion of exposure. And they're really related to each other, right? If the amount of charge that was deposited in that air is very closely related to how much energy was deposited in that air. But for us, we're, we're really most interested in the tissue kerma for various tissues in the body, right? What's the, what's the amount that was deposited in the skin, the soft tissues? What's the amount that was deposited in the liver? What's the amount of energy that was deposited in the bone, let's say, or the bone marrow kind of thing? So we need to extend this notion a little bit. I want, I want to stop for a second because that certainly that air kerma, right, that's very closely related to that um, exposure that we talked about. If you take that and you multiply it by the size of the area that's irradiated, you get something called the uh, kerma 
um, area product or the air kerma area product or sometimes called the dose area product. And how many people report the dose area product as part of their fluoroscopy studies, right? And it's one of the measures, one of the quality measures that you can utilize there. It, it doesn't give you everything that you need, right? It, it tells you something about the energy in air, right, at the entrance, just before the radiation entered the patient. It tells you something about the energy there, which in truth is cl closely related to some, the energy that's going to be deposited in the patient. But we need to know a few other things, right? We have to know, uh, it's helpful to know what the filtration was on the beam, right? What's the, the quality of our x-ray beam? It, this is really a little bit more of a, a, a measure of the quantity of that x-ray beam. Um, just as a point of reference, for most of our conventional x-ray studies, where we maybe take one, two, or three views or so, we're really talking about one gray per centimeter squared. That, that's, a, that's the air kerma for one of those studies. So if you look at the just before the radiation enters the skin, you know, that's the kind of value that you would get. And if you did it for one of the GI fluoro studies, where there's multiple minutes of fluoroscopy, perhaps a few spot images, those kind of things, those, are, those studies are typically on the order of 10 times that plain film study. And for some co the complex IR procedures, you know, it's an order of 10-fold ten, in terms of that. And of course, those are general rule kind of numbers, but I give them to you just as a little bit of a point of reference, right, for thinking about what some of the doses might be on those studies. Ag again. It's more complicated than that because so far we still haven't talked anything about where that dose is being applied. And we certainly know that certain parts of the body are much more radio uh, sensitive than others. So, so let, me, let me turn to this notion of absorbed dose. And I'm going to extend the notion of absorbed dose and talk a little bit about exposure. Certainly I could do it with air kerma as well. But absorbed dose is a measure of the amount of radiation uh, energy absorbed per unit mass of a medium. So for us, again, this is going to be, be the patient. Uh, it's, it's still in that units of energy per unit mass or joules per kilogram. At diagnostic energies of air kerma of one milligray um, results in an absorbed dose of approximately one milligray in the soft tissues. Not quite. Usually the soft tissue kerma is a little bit greater than the air kerma. Remember, right, the soft tissues really have a little bit higher Z than air does. So actually there's a little bit more energy deposited there. And then, so usually that's about 1.1 times. And then unfortunately, as radiation goes through, we talked about these backscattering events that can occur. And if you get a little bit of backscatter and you include that as well, this number can maybe go from 1 to 1.5 if you wanted to convert the air kerma uh, to the soft tissue kerma, but rough ballpark, they're fairly close to each other. If I look at the conversion factor between exposure, right, now this is charge per kilogram and absorbed dose, the same thing is true. Really at diagnostic x-ray energies, that conversion factor, that F, is approximately a one. So if you, if you tell me what the, um, the exposure was, I can you usually say that's roughly going to be equal to what the absorbed dose is. As a matter of fact, here's a chart. It's a little, little bit confusing because the F factor for bone numbers are here, and notice the scale is different than the F factor for water and muscle. Here this goes from 0.8 up to 1, and this goes from 1 up to 4. Notice at lower energies, right, the bone value is up here in the 3, 4 kind of range. That shouldn't surprise us, right? The calcium in bone is some of the highest Z tissues in the body. So the conversion factor, that F, is a larger than number 1. And notice here, for muscle and water, that number stays in the kind of the 0 0.88, 0 0.96 range across the range of energies. As you get up, right, as you get up, into this higher x-ray energy, notice that the bone drops down to very close to one as well. So notice bone, water, and muscle at up above 100 keV or so. Those con that conversion factor is very close to one. So just want to emphasize a few things with that, right? That the conversion factors for different tissues are different and they depend on en the energies, right? And, and so just keep that in mind as well. The other thing I wanted to say about absorbed dose, right, is here we have the patient and we uh, illuminate them with this x-ray beam, if you will, and we really want to know how much energy is deposited here. 
I guess you could figure that out if you could somehow capture all of the energy that escapes the patient, either through scatter or just proceeds through and uh, through the other side of the patient as a primary. The problem is we don't even stop all of those. So that's, this is a very difficult thing to measure. And the other thing I want to mention to you is that the absorbed dose is defined per unit kilogram of tissue, right? So when I calculate the absorbed dose for irradiating the patient's right hand, I get a particular number. And when I irradiate their left hand, I get a particular number. But remember, I irradiated a separate mass of soft tissue here. So in doing this, the absorbed dose has not changed for the study, right? Because the amount of energy deposited per kilogram of tissue that was irradiated isn't changed by that second uh, exposure, right? All right? Because I irradiated a different kilogram of tissue when I did that. And so you can see, again, the reason I bring this up is this is helpful to us in terms of the deterministic effect, right? What are the chances that this patient gets a radiation burn to their hand? Well, it doesn't make any sense to be adding the dose that occurred to the left hand when we're interested in knowing what the chance of a radiation burn was to that right hand, right? So absorb dose for those deterministic effects. On the other hand, you may, well, wait a second. I need to count both of these because the chance that the patient may get a cancer a DNA strand break from this does take into account both of these things being irradiated. So we need to extend our notion of absorbed dose to come up with something that better quantifies that stochastic effect. <clears throat> so the absorbed dose is a little bit better measure of the radiation risk. It's really the most useful thing that we have in terms of evaluating those deterministic effects. I already mentioned skin injuries, cataract formation. It still doesn't take into account where that radiation uh, is being absorbed or the radiation type, frankly. So the next step I want to make is, is go to something called equivalent dose. I'm going to extend the notion of absorbed dose to equivalent dose. And the only thing that this does is it takes into account the type of radiation. So was this low LET radiation? Is this high LET radiation? Um, and uh, it gives it a weighting factor for that particular type of radiation. And th this can be important because some of the things that we give patients in nuclear medicine have a combination of some of the different types of radiation, right? Some things emit beta particles as well as, so energetic electrons, as well as produce gamma rays in their decay scheme. Fortunately, both of those have LET values that are low um, or the same, but you can imagine if you, people were being irradiated with radiations, part of which was low LET, part of which was high LET, you need to count for the effects of both of those. So it's the units of equivalent dose are called the sievert. It's still that amount of energy per kilogram. It's just that we also apply this uh, unitless weighting to that. And here are the weighting factors. So here's that beta and here's that photon. And based on our first uh, few minutes of discussion this morning, right, you understand why these get the same weighting factor because in effect, these x-rays and gamma rays, the first thing they do when they interact in the tissue is produce energetic electrons, right? Protons, um, because they're more massive and have a, uh, um, the same charge as well as an electron, they have a slightly higher weighting factor. Alpha particles, right, two protons, two neutrons, right, quite a bit more massive, a bit more charge, have a much higher weighting factor. Neutrons are, 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 are a more complicated issue, and I'm not going to get into those there, but I just wanted to show those weighting factors. So now, if we know what our absorbed dose was, and we can apply then the appropriate weighting factor to that, we'll get the equivalent dose on that. that. So for us, for diagnostic x-ray energies, that weighting factor is a one, uh, so that really becomes a little bit of a non-issue. Non so now we've accounted for uh, the type of radiation that's depositing within the tissues. And the next thing we want to do is really account for the different types of tissues that end up being irradiated. And that's what we do by extending that notion of um, equivalent dose to effective dose. 
So effective dose takes into account where that radiation is being absorbed. Um, it attempts to reflect what the risk would be if the entire body got a uniform dose of radiation, right? So we know that when we do certain exams, uh, let's say a chest CT, uh, most of the abdomen structures, especially the lower abdomen and pelvis, don't see much in the way of radiation, and must, most, almost all the radiation dose is concentrated in the thorax. So what equivalent, effective dose sorry, tries to answer is, if we irradiated the entire body with the dose of radiation, what would be the dose that we would irradiate it with that would give an equivalent risk of give some of these stochastic effects from what that chest CT provided? That's what this is doing. And you've got to do that if we want to make comparisons between studies, okay? Of course, that's not a very easy thing to do, and in fact, uh, some of this really in involves um, a little bit of selecting approximate numbers to come up with a calculation, and I want you to, to realize that by the time we finish. So we're trying to capture what that stochastic risk is, that risk of a, a cancer or a genetic risk from that radiation. And again, the unit is still the sievert, uh, joules per kilogram, it's just that we're going to have these unitless weighting factors again. So how do, we, how do we calculate those? So now to get the effective dose, we're going to separate the body into a bunch of different tissue types, T, right? We're going to have bone marrow, and we're going to have uh, skin, and we're going to have um, breast tissue, and we're going to have GI uh, tissue there. And for each of those tissue types, we're going to have a different weighting factor depending upon how radiation sensitive it is. And we're going to multiply that by the uh, absorbed dose actually the equivalent dose, but our weighting factor is one, so those turn out the same. The equivalent dose that that particular tissue type saw as part of the examination. So here are those tissue weighting factors. So here's 1997, here's 1991, here's 2007. Notice these all add up to one. In other words, we're still going to get uh, uh, the same, um, the, the distribution that the entire body sees is a, a value of one quantity, but notice that things like the bone marrow weight quite a bit higher than the uh, surface of the skin, which is 0 0.01, because the skin is relatively radiation insensitive, while the bone marrow is quite radiation sensitive. And that's what these weighting factors are trying to accomplish. Now, the fact that these numbers have changed, and changed as drastically have, as they have in some instances, ought to give you an idea that this is at best an approximation, right? At best an approximation. Uh, this uh, notion of the uh, effective dose. And so doing this, you know, think about how you would do this, right? So let's think about a chest x-ray. So in a chest x-ray, okay, well, the gonad doesn't see any radiation, hardly, none at all, and so that gets multiplied by a weighting factor of 0 0.08. The bone marrow, we could calculate the dose of the red bone marrow in the, the thoracic spine and multiply that by the 0 0.12 factor. And certainly the lung gets a dose, and if we knew what that dose was, we could multiply that by the 0 0.12. The brain doesn't really see any dose, right, in a chest x-ray, so we'd be multiplying this 0 0.01 times a zero term, and we'd add those up, and we'd get a number for a chest x-ray right in this order right here. And now if we did a, a CT scan of the abdomen or pelvis, we could do a similar thing, applying the doses of the individual organs received by their appropriate weighting factors and then adding those up. And doing that gives us this table, you know, where we can now start to compare things to each other. But realize this comparison is, right, at best an approximation, going through this measure, measurement of effective dose that we talked about. Does that make sense to everyone? So now does everyone have a feeling for what absorbed dose is, right, what equivalent dose is, and then what effective dose is, and, and, and uh, those numbers. Really, effective dose is meant to be able to allow us to kind of approximate the population effects 
of radiation, right? It's not meant to be applied on an individual basis. Um, and unfortunately, we see a lot where people try to use it to, to do that, right? Well, what's the effective dose that this patient received during a CT scan, right? That's, that's not what this quantity is really meant to do. Um, so by way of review, right, exposure, ability of radiation to ionize air, right, we talked about the fact that there's something called the air kerma, which is closely related to this, which is really the uh, ability of how much energy is deposited in that air. The absorbed dose, right, it's the energy imparted to the irradiated tissue. We'd love to be able to calculate the absorbed dose in all the different organs in the body because it's frankly those numbers that we're gonna then use to extend down to the notion of effective dose. And this is really the thing that we're going to use to calculate our deterministic effects. Our equivalent dose takes into account the radiation type, really not uh, as important to us, but we do see the term. And re the reason that is is just because for the radiation that we'll be working with, that, ra <laughs> that correction factor for the radiation type is a one. And then our effective dose, where we're measuring that population risk posed by radiation. And this is what we use to help quantify the stochastic risks of radiation. So I wanna talk just a little bit about radiation biology and mostly how it just pertains to, you know, how were those risks in that table? How were they set? And, and frankly, some of them were set uh, based on some experimental data, right? How, how sensitive are tissues to uh, radiation in the lab? Um, and, but some general rules, right? If you take a look at the parts of the cell cycle <clears throat> where uh, the cell is ap actively replicating DNA and get ready to divide, in that er time around that point, that's when the cell is, is most uh, sensitive. And in the S phase, the least sensitive phase. So if you think about it, cells that spend more of their time kind of replicating are more likely to have some proportion in one of, one of those phases right there. And so it is in general, although not always true, that cells that are uh, more highly metabolically active and are replicating more frequently are more sensitive to radiation damage. And there's a number of different ways that can happen. You certainly, uh, an x-ray could directly damage DNA. The x-ray could happen to interact with uh, an atom or a molecule right within a strand of DNA. But more commonly, the damage is indirect. We talked about the production of these um, hydroxyl radicals, and a lot of the damage is mediated through that. You know, any time any of us is irradiated, we, pro we have some of this damage occurring, and so, you know, we certainly don't all develop cancer. As a matter of fact, we're exposed to radiation on a daily basis, uh, just sitting where we are, certainly when we step out into the sun. You know, our body has mechanisms to, to repair that, and frankly, sometimes if the damage is great, the, the cell will just die from that and not propagate or perpetuate that damage that's occurred. And so, so that's an, another part of the reason why we don't see, uh, you know, a bunch of cancers from any radiation effects that we see, right? We, our, our body is set up to repair some of that. This is just showing those phases of the, the cell cycle where we prepare to divide and division is, is undergoing that are very sensitive and kind of this quiescent phase here in the S phase. You know, I, I just wanted to mention that although these, these, it is generally true that cells which have greater reproductive activity are more sensitive, it's not always true. For instance, the lymphocytes and the oocytes are very radiation sensitive, but these are, these are resting cells. And so, you know, there's certainly more to the story than just uh, how, how often the, the cells are replicating. And then, as I mentioned, if you look at those weighting factors on the tables for effective dose, they roughly follow this rule, right? Why is skin, why, why, why is the brain, why are muscle cells relatively radiation insensitive? Um, and the reason for that is that they really don't have that same reproductive activity. And I just showed that again, you know, just looking through some of this, right? Here's the skin at a 0 0.01. 
And you've got to be a little bit careful because look at the thyroid, right? The thyroid doesn't have a huge weighting factor, but remember, the thyroid is a relatively small, right? It's a very small piece of tissue. It's quite radiation sensitive uh, given, given its size. It contributes a significant proportion, right? 4% to this for an organ which is nowhere near 4% of your total body weight. Um, and so just looking, looking at those numbers to keep that in mind. I think we mentioned the fact that uh, x-rays can interact directly with DNA, but that's uncommon and that most of the damage is uh, mediated through this free radical production. Uh, there are a lot of DNA repair mechanisms that can limit that damage, and then with that severe damage, the cells might become senescent or undergo apoptosis, and th that helps limit those effects. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the body organ effects. Uh, you know, these whole body effects, the um, lethal dose um, that it would kill 50% of the population at 60 days is approximately four gray in hu humans, right? And this is, this is nothing that anyone would ever be exposed to in, as part of a radiologic procedure. These are really radiation accident levels, right? So acute radiation syndromes, you know, you really suppress the bone marrow with values in that two to four gray range. You gastrointestinal syndrome, eight to 10 gray, where you really just slough the entire mucosa of your gastrointestinal system. And these cerebrovascular systems where unfortunately you get this terrible cerebral edema and really die from that typically in the matter uh, of uh, hours. Um, all these acute radiation syndromes, you know, have sort of different um, manifestations, but I want you to realize, right, if you, if you get eight to 10 gray, in addition to getting GI syndrome, probably superimposed on that, right, you have this hematopoietic syndrome if there was uh, an entire whole body uh, radiation exposure there. It's just that, right, it's unlikely that you survive with this and your death is usually within a couple of weeks. And so really in some ways, this, terrible GI syndrome almost uh, overwhelms the manifestations of this hemopoietic uh, syndrome here. And notice this cerebrovascular syndrome, right? Matter with death within three days. I mean, this GI syndrome and this hematopoietic syndrome, they may not even have fully manifested themselves by the time, unfortunately, you're, you're, you're dead from those things. These radiation, uh, acute radiation sicknesses can have these kind of four stages that people talk about. This prodromal stage where you've got this nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea begins uh, and uh, lasts minutes to days. And again, the, the range for those have to do with what level of exposure did you have? Were you in that hemopoietic range? Uh, so the time at which that would start. You know, a lot of these have a little bit of a latent period um, where the patient actually feels a little bit better after that first prodromal stage. And again, that may last a few hours if the exposure was very high, like in the cerebrovascular syndrome, or a matter of days if it was the uh, GI or the hematopoietic syndrome. And then you get this manifest illness stage, and those symptoms, of course, depend on which of those syndromes, and they may last uh, hours uh, to several months, depending on which one they are, and patients recover. Really, recovery is almost only seen with the hematopoietic uh, syn syndrome uh, and, or you know, pr proceed to death. Um, and the only time we really see these occasionally, they'll ask us questions about these, you know, what are you going to do with a patient who, who is, uh, presents with one of these syndro syndromes from a radi radiation accident or whatever, and, and, and the answer is you're going to treat them like you would treat any, treat any other patient. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about deterministic effects. So now we're going to talk about that dose, but we're going to talk about doses that are much lower than that range that uh, lends itself to those uh, acu acute radiation sickness syndromes. For deterministic effects, we think there's a, there's a threshold, right? So in other words, below a certain level of dose, these don't occur. And then above that level, we start to see them occurring. And the severity of them is proportional to how much, how much above that level of threshold we are. So again, using uh, skin injury as our example, we don't think that skin injury occurs if the radiation level is kept below a certain amount. 
And then if it goes above that, the severity of the skin damage increases as the irradiation exposure goes above that level. And each organ has a specific dose for which that occurs, and the classic examples are cataract formation, skin injury, and, and sterility, and they're the ones I'll mention here. So we think the threshold for cataract formation is 0.5 gray. By the way, before 2011, we listed it as at 2 gray. So again, you ought to realize that this notion of this threshold is kind of a general rule of thumb, right? I mean, before 2011, we thought the threshold was 2 gray, and then we reduced it to 1 fourth that value for the threshold. You wonder how well we know what some of these thresholds really are. And there are recommendations for decreasing, um, they were recommended that year for decreasing the annual equivalent dose to 20 millisieverts averaged over five years with no single year exceeding 50 millisieverts to help stay below that uh, half a gray range. The, the truth is, wear your eye protection during your fluoro procedures, right? Because um, one, the, the lens of the eye is relatively sensitive to radiation uh, with cataract formation, and so we don't, clearly we don't know what the threshold level is accurately by, by that change. So just the prudent thing to do is to wear your eye protection there. So what about skin injury? So the threshold is about two gray. Now, now this is fairly high, right? This is getting in that range of that hemopoietic syndrome that we're talk, talking about. And, and usually we only see this in kind of restricted areas to the body, a focal dose on examinations that would take a fairly long period of time. So think about cardiac interventional procedures, right, where you might be, they're having difficulty with uh, placing stents or something that go on an extended period of time. Um, perhaps uh, a, a tips that becomes overly complicated and so you know if you change your projection so that your skin entry site that your radiation beam is going through varies a little bit where you can help protect because you're not irradiating the same mass of tissue over and over again so there's a couple things there the range of severity right at, at uh, transient erythema, uh, erythema at 2 gray dermal necrosis at 18, secondary ulceration at 20 gray. And there's actually some, some nice studies looking at the fluoro time, and you can see here going down from the early transient uh, erythema, temporary ep epilation, uh, main erythema, permanent epilation, down as the dose increases. But, but some of this is probably best demonstrated by the, the number of uh, uh, images that are out there in some publications and some case reports and different things where you notice that here's that kind of almost prodromal type phenomenon that we were talking about when we talked about radiation sickness, right? There's a, an injury, a, a burn that occurred early on which really looked like it healed up fairly nicely at 20 weeks, but due to the death of the tissue deep to that, right, the, the deep layer in the dermis at 20 weeks, we see this tremendous ulceration there. In terms of sterility, uh, permanent sterility in about the four gray range, uh, lower in men uh, than women. Uh, the threshold decreases with age, so that goes lower as we get older. And temporary sterility in men uh, as low as a, a half a gray exposure. Um, so, you know, we you certainly, unless we're doing some procedure that involves the gonads or having to be able to see something right in the rear. It's hard, you can't shield the pelvis in a woman if what you're trying to look at are the pelvic structures, right? But, uh, but if in an exam where we're looking in another region, certainly shielding uh, is help, can be helpful. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, the stochastic effects. So with stochastic effects, we don't think there's a threshold, right? So that a single X-ray just a single photon may unfortunately damage something that results in someone getting a cancer. So the probability of the effect increases with increasing dose, right? So if with a single x-ray the probability is 0 0.000000001, with more x-rays than that, that probability increases. But the severity doesn't increase, right? It's not that, well, you got a higher dose of radiation, therefore you're more likely to get a more aggressive cancer, right? So probability of the disease goes up with dose. 
but the severity of the disease doesn't necessarily go up with dose. That's different from those deterministic effects that we, we talked about. There's a latency period. There's a period of time between when that radiation occurred and when these uh, uh, things manifest themselves. And we use a linear no-threshold model of risk to do that. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And by the way, that model, frankly, is probably not correct, but it's probably the most prudent model for us to work with in the absence of better, better knowledge than we have. And our, the prototypic example is cancer, although some of the genetic uh, effects we, we could also include in that. All right, so I think I mentioned all of that already. We mentioned uh, the latency. Um, the latency can be decades, and uh, we talked about this linear no-threshold model. So risk is proportional to dose, and there's no minimum safe dose, linear and no-threshold to that. And he here's that model. So here's our linear no-threshold model. Um, so our knowledge about the risk that radiation poses is really based on people being exposed to much higher level doses of radiation, right? We know from, unfortunately, nuclear accidents, atomic bomb blasts, things, how, what, how harmful doses of radiation are up in this range. And if we linearly extrapolate from those, we get that very low level of radiation has some harmful effect here, and that's... Uh, um, what we assume, that there is no threshold, that any bit of radiation might be the case. Here would be a threshold model. This would say that, you know what, if the radiation exposure you get is lower than this amount, it, it, it has no negative effect, has no beneficial effect, has no negative effect. And here's the hormetic model, where we've got this hormesis, where this really says that below a certain level, radiation actually has a beneficial effect. Okay, and the truth is that these low levels, we don't particularly know. I mean, it, it may intuitively make sense that we ought to have some protective mechanism to radiation. After all, we live exposed to radiation on a daily basis, right? The body ought to have repair mechanisms for handling low levels of damage from radiation. But the truth is, we don't know for sure what this level is, if or even if this threshold model is true. And so the safer thing to assume is this linear no threshold model even if we feel like that may be overly conservative. The problem with that is there are a lot of people out here who take the linear no threshold model that we use, which we're purposely using to be really conservative. And they say, oh, well, at this low level of radiation, here's the number of harmful cancers you create. And then they multiply it by the entire population receiving that dose of radiation and say, here are, many, here are how many cancers created by doing CT exams. And does everyone see, again, I want to tell you, right, we make this assumption so that we minimize where our deleterious effects that radiation might have. Right? It's a very different thing to then use those numbers, apply them to a population as a whole, and say that is the deleterious effect that it does have. Okay? Stochastic effects. So we talked about the prototype of cancers. There are numerous examples of radiation exposure resulting in increased number of cancers later in life. Greater risk with earlier age of exposure and greater risk depending upon the types of tissue irradiated. And I show a chart here, and, and you'll notice that nothing in this chart has to do with patients received a C one CT scan when they were uh, a kid or whatever. These are people who had a radiation dose of greater than 50 gray uh, associated with central nervous system uh, tumors or got radiation treatment for a leukemia. And then the types of cancers that they ended up developing later on, so central nervous system, thyroid, and breast cancers, whatever. So again, right, a lot of these cancers that we see developing later in life have to do with much higher doses of radiation than most of our diagnostic imaging studies. So what are the sources of, of radiation? Just to, to briefly go over, over those, right? Because I already have mentioned to you that um, you know, we, we see quite a bit of radiation exposure just from natural background. So the average person receives about 620 millirams uh, per year. 50% of that is background. 
and 50% of that is man-made. And, and the man-made radiation is almost exclusively from medical sources. And in medical sources, CT is the major contributor to that. As a matter of fact, 50% of the man-made exposure per, uh, approximately is from CT. So of the exposure the population sees, right, 25% of the total radiation exposure the population sees is from CT. Half of it natural occurring, half of it medical, and half of that medical half is CT, 25% from CT. So where, does that, where are the natural sources? Well, some of it's from the soil, right? Some of it's for, from radon and thoron. Radon, unfortunately, when it decays, gives off an alpha particle, right? We, we don't worry a whole lot about alpha particles because they are so massive, right? They have two protons and two neutrons, and they have plus two charge that, frankly, if someone were shooting a beam of alpha particles at you, if you held up a piece of paper, it would stop those alpha particles. But unfortunately, those get liberated into the air. And when we inhale that air, right, they can then end up landing on the surface, the lining of the lungs and those kind of things. So that's how our dose tends to, tends to occur, occur from those. And unfortunately, in people in certain parts of the country, right, in their basements, uh, there's some radon gas that's liberated through there, and, uh, and people end up getting exposed as that decays and gives off those alpha particles. Uh, there's some extraterrestrial component, right? 5% of it comes from extraterrestrial. 5% uh, or so comes from the food chain, uh, potassium. So anybody who eats bananas, uh, you're exposing yourself to some potassium-40 there. So what about the man-made? About 50%, as I mentioned, about half of, half of that's coming from CT. Nuclear medicine's the next big player, interventional, and then radiography, fluoro, a smaller uh, proportion. And then there's a small amount of other, industrial, occupational, consumer goods kind of thing. And here's a nice chart uh, that kind of breaks down some of, some of the sources. So look, the background from radon and thoron, right, is really the only thing that's bigger than CT here. But I want to make one point about this portion of this, and that is, yes, there is some variation in that. You know, if you decide to live in Colorado instead of living uh, at sea level, your exposure to naturally occurring radiation is higher uh, than it is. But, but this portion, the 50% that's medical, is, is, has a very different distribution. And, in the days of HIPAA, I can't, ask, I can't ask this question anymore, but I used to always ask something like, you know, how many people in the room had a CT scan this past year? Okay, because when you look at the radiation dose uh, seen um, by the population, it's around on the order of every person in the country getting one CT a year. That's, that's what the medical dis, uh, dose is. A and yet, in the room, there would be maybe two or three people who would raise their hand and had a CT scan. And as radiologists, we've all been in the rating room where we've pulled up the patient who's gotten their, you know, sixth renal stone protocol CT of, of the year kind of thing, right? So there's a very unequal distribution of the medical sources of radiation. I think I mentioned all of these things before, just checking through there to make sure you've got, the, got those. Yes, and I, I just, I mentioned this too, right? This um, 6.2 millisieverts, that's approximately the amount, this is the amount that we get from medical uh, on average. That's the approximately the amount of an abdomen pelvis CT. So like I said, if you, if you took all the medical and you uniformly distributed it across the entire population, it would kind of be the equivalent of everybody getting an abdomen pelvis CT each year. All right, so what are we gonna to do to minimize our exposure? And uh, we've already talked about a number of these things when we talked about how to operate the fluoro unit uh, yesterday. So, ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable, right? Uh, again, we're gonna get back to the fact that we don't really know what the deleterious effects of low level of radiation are. So the prudent thing is to assume that there's some risk and therefore keep the dose to any patient as low as we possibly can, as low as we can keep it to get of us good diagnostic quality images. And so, you know, let's not do any unnecessary imaging, right? Ta try to do the best you can to inform your docs about not doing that uh, 12th renal stone protocol on that patient in, in one year. 
Um, automated decision support is going to help with that, I think, to some degree. That's going to become mandated. I think uh, some of our referring physicians will respond a little bit better if they have a, a software system that's making some recommendations to them rather than maybe feeling that they're being told what they have to do by the radiologist over the phone kind of thing. You, know, you guys are all familiar with the Image Wisely and the Image Gently uh, uh, programs, I'm sure. Right, in radiography, we want to make sure we use our appropriate technique. We want to make sure we get the minimum number of views that we need to answer the clinical question. I talked about the importance of collimation, selecting that appropriate study, and making sure we minimize repeat studies. And a lot of places are doing this. You know, we don't, we don't get those every morning chest radiographs uh, uh, nearly as much as we used to, used to get them. Fluoroscopy, we already went through all of this. Again, that technique, uh, using pulse fluoro, using that image, last image hold feature, collimating, getting rid of that grid for our small patients, right? And using mag mode only when it's absolutely necessary. We're gonna talk more about CT over the next couple of hours, but again, we wanna use appropriate protocols. Make sure our coverage is appropriate, right? That our abdomen and pelvis CT doesn't start at the level of the great vessels, if you will. Um, minimize those multi-phase exams um, and make sure we use an appropriate pitch. Again, minimizing those repeat studies and, and consider using some cross-sectional imaging alternatives that uh, don't involve ionizing radiation when appropriate. For nuclear medicine, we need to make sure we use the appropriate dose, right? One way you can get image faster in nuclear medicine is give the patient a higher dose of, um, of uh, your radiopharmaceutical. But unfortunately, that results in a higher dose to them. Make sure we've got the appropriate study choice, good quality control, make sure we maximize the imaging performance of our gamma cameras. Um, again, minimizing those repeat studies, and of course, I'm going to mention using non-ionizing radiation alternatives again. In terms of minimizing exposure, right, time's the most important thing, right? So the less amount, of t the least amount of time the scanner, the, the fluoroscopy uh, can be on, the better it is for that patient. Remember the R squared law, right? So again, when we talk about minimizing exposure, we're talking not just to the patient, but to you. So when you're doing a fluoro exam, you know, stay at arm's length, right? Get your arm, uh, 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 no need to stand right up against the table there. Wear our shielding, remember five millimeter of lead equivalent reduces the intensity of about, by about 90% at diagnostic energies. And we wanna shield patients and workers, but workers, that's very important. Shielding patients is a little bit complicated, realize, because like in a CT scan, most of the dose that organs inside the body receive are from scatter inside the body. And putting a shield over the patient doesn't help in that regard, okay? As a matter of fact, in some situations, it makes it slightly worse because you get backscatter of that radiation back into the patient. So we really want to be careful about when we shield. And then how would we measure our exposure? Well, to keep track on that, we all mostly wear uh, personal dosimeters, and most of us use these um, um, thermoluminescent or optically stimulated uh, dosimeters. Film dosimeters are really a thing of the past. And, Ionization chambers, uh, Geiger counters used um, when uh, we maybe have some uh, dosage or spillage issues. But I just want to show this old film dosimeter because, you know, the concept will be really kind of straightforward to you. It just had a piece of film in it. And in addition to that, on the front plastic housing, it had different materials made out of uh, diff different uh, uh, types of things like one was made out of Teflon, one's made out of lead, one's made out of copper, and those are really, they're filters, right? They're acting to filter the x-ray beam. And so you notice you've got this variation in exposure on the surface of that. When low energy, some of that metal had really great stopping power for those low energy x-rays. And as you got higher up, notice that they didn't have very good stopping power at all. So by looking at the variation of exposure, you could get a rough idea of what the average energy of radiation exposure was. And then by looking at overall, globally, how exposed this piece of film was, you can get an idea of the total 
amount of that, of that particular type of exposure. But those have been really been um, replaced with these ring badges or a thermoluminescent dosimeter. And by now, you guys can translate what that means, right? We've talked about materials that when they are struck by radiation can move electrons from inner valence bands to outer, um, outer uh, conduction bands. And some of them are relatively stable in that pattern. And here, that amount of electrons that are moved into that outer band and are sitting there stably is proportional to the amount of dose that that badge received, that ring badge received. And what we do is we heat it up, and when we heat this up, those electrons move back into their inner bands, and this gives off light. And the light that we would receive from that is proportional to the amount of dose that was received by that badge, a thermoluminescent dosimeter. These are optically stimulated luminescent dosimeters. Okay, and again, you guys, I won't go through the whole discussion of what that means because now you can work that out based on those words. But, but this is the dosimeter that I think probably most of us wear. Do most of you wear a dosimeter that looks like this? Show of hands, yes? Yeah, so, so, so let's just talk about it a little bit. When you get back home, I want you to feel the front of that dosimeter. The first thing I want you to notice is that this plastic housing, there's a little circle here that the plastic housing is missing from it. It's only covered with a, a really thin piece of adhesive plastic that's put over the surface of that. And that's the beta window. Because remember, beta, that has mass, those are electrons. They have mass and they have charge. So they don't penetrate very far through any material. So we actually decrease the thickness of the plastic housing to be able to detect the beta window there. And then notice we've got a little, what looks like a little um, uh, grid right here. And it is a little grid, this little imaging window that they call it, that's a grid. Here's a static exposure through the imaging window, and here's a dynamic exposure. And notice in the static exposure, you get these little very, they look like ski moguls almost, right? And they're very uniform in their structure. And this is how with that dosimeter, it's determined that you accidentally left your dosimeter sitting in the fluoroscopy room um, on your lead for the last two and a half weeks, right? It gets a static exposure because it's not moving around in the room when that occurs, okay? And then we've got a couple of different filters here. We've got a copper aluminum filter and a copper filter. Again, that helps us sort out what was the average X-ray energy of exposure or gamma ray energy of exposure there. And then again, the amount of total light that this um, puts out when we stimulate it opt optically will give us a, an idea of the total exposure. So we get an idea of the average energy of the exposure. We get an idea of the amount of that exposure from that device. Ionization chambers measure the amount of charge liberated when photons interact with gas in the chamber. We've already seen this idea. We, we talked about it earlier when we were measuring uh, exposure, and in that case, that gas was just air. Uh, they're quite accurate, and they can be used to measure the output of X-ray tubes, photomultipliers, uh, as photomultipliers in automatic exposure control units, and as dose calibrators in nuclear medicine. And Geiger counters are just ionization chambers that are operating in avalanche mode, so that if that, that, that voltage that we put across those plates here is just much higher, so that if any one of these events occur, we get this avalanche of uh, electrons flowing acro across that surface. Here's a small little pocket ionization chamber. You just look down through the eyepiece and you measure the amount of radiation. Here's, there's a Geiger counter right there. So in terms of radiation protection, I'm gonna let you guys kind of handle looking at those different numbers and making sure you memorize, but realize there are regulations for workers patients in terms of dose limits and some of those uh, uh, regulatory agents. In terms of workers, we're primarily exposed during fluoroscopy, and scatter is the primary source of exposure for us. And remember that scatter has a very non-uniform distribution, and scatter's greatest at the skin entrance site. And for this reason, in most of our fluoro fluoroscopic procedures, we want the x-ray tube underneath the patient so that all this scatter that occurs is heading down towards our feet, relatively radiation insensitive 
tissues of the body. When you put the x-ray tube above the patient, the scatter is now going to be much more up in your face. Now, if you're looking at a lateral, right, so there's that picture with the tube above. If you're looking at the lateral, the scatter is the worst on the x-ray tube side of the patient. So you'd really like to be working on the II or flat panel detector side of the patient because of that non-even distribution of scatter. And there's a few of some of those uh, regulatory uh, limits there. And uh, again, like I said, I, I, you, can, you can look at some of, look up those numbers and memorize some of those things there. So just in summary, right, we just kind of did a whirlwind tour of a little bit of uh, radiation dosimetry, right, uh, radiation biology, kind of really hitting some of the salient points. Um, hopefully you have a much better feeling for what absorbed dose, what effective dose are, and, and how we utilize those. Um, quantities. Thanks a bunch.